When most people think of cycling, they think of the steep hills and thrilling sprints of the Tour de France. But one of the sport's oldest and most coveted records is something called the hour record. It's very simple. One person, one bike, riding for one hour on a track like this. How much distance can they cover? The first official record was set in the late 1800s. And since then, many of the greats of the sport have attempted the hour. Today, the men's record is 54.526 kilometers, or just under 34 miles. For women, it's 48.007 kilometers, just shy of 30 miles. But can somebody ride even farther? Today, we're gonna look at why riding 60 kilometers in one hour is almost impossible. To find out what it takes, I tried riding as hard as the current record holder, discussed the pain of riding that hard for a full hour with someone who's done it. All your body is just screaming, stop, stop. Very good, very good, Robbie. And worked with a sports scientist to find out what my body is capable of. Nice, the O2's into the 50s, perfect, that's excellent. The hour record has been called the purest of all cycling races, but actually doing it is anything but simple. It's become a team effort with designers, coaches, and athletes all trying to roll just a bit further. They use state-of-the-art tools like wind tunnels and power meters to gain every competitive advantage. No detail is too small. You have the wheels, the frame, the helmet, and the shape of that helmet. You know, we can get somebody to save quite a bit of drag. But first, you've got to have the strength and stamina to push hard for an hour. The hour record is a very personal endeavor. It's all about you, your machine, and how much power you can put out for 60 minutes straight. It's usually a lot of power, and it has to be very consistent. It's a lot harder than it sounds. But today, I'm gonna try to maintain the same power as the current men's world record holder, and just see how long I can last. To help me today is Evelyn Stevens. She's a former hour record holder herself, and she is gonna be controlling the machine that I'm currently pedaling away on. Stevens retired from racing in 2016, but before she did, she set a new hour record by riding an incredible 47.98 kilometers, almost 30 miles. And our record proved to be one of the most, if not the most challenging thing I did during my career. There's a lot that goes into the hour, but one way that cyclists look at racing these days is through something called power output. It's measured in watts. A bike commuter might generate about 100 watts. Pro sprinters can generate nearly 2,000 watts, but only in short bursts. The hour is all about a steady, prolonged power output. It's kind of a meditative process in a kind of a masochistic way. When Steven set her record, she kept up an output of around 300 watts for a full hour. Bradley Wiggins, who has the current men's record, is estimated to have cranked out 440 watts for an hour. So what kind of power output am I having right now? So Robbie, you're currently going 150 watts. Okay, and how much power do I need to put out? We're gonna need to get you to 440 watts. <laughs> okay. So next okay. stop, 200. All right. Stevens used an app to increase the wattage on my trainer, which made it harder and harder for me to pedal. Okay, you're now at 200. All right, you're at 250. How's it feeling? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for the next? Yeah, let's take it to let's 300. Let's get there. Oh, it's way harder if I watch you <laughs> increase it like that. So Evelyn, I've heard that when you're actually trying this record, you aren't actually allowed to look at your power output. No, when you do the record, you have no data whatsoever. So you have no power, no RPM, no time, no distance, nothing. You are just, it is truly you and your machine. Okay, I think this is kind of an, probably an uncomfortable level, so I think we should just yeah. keep, we should keep going. <laughs> Let's go right Let's to Let's go 400. right to 400. Okay, we're at 401. Ah. Okay, well, should we just go right to 440? Yeah. Okay, you're at 441. We're giving you a little extra. So remember, he did this for 60 minutes. All right, you got, what oh, was that, about 30 seconds? You think, Robbie, can you do it for an hour? No. <laughs> oh, God. Man, I, am... I think you held that for about 45 seconds. God, that was ridiculous. You'd have to hold that 
more than 60 times longer than I just held it. Yeah. And actually focus on where you're going. And you do it from a standing start. Ah, uh, that sounds miserable. That misery is what cyclists call the pain cave. And enduring it for a full hour is incredibly difficult. Stevens told me that she nearly cracked with only a few minutes left during her attempt. There was, I think, about minute 50 to 55 of the hour record. I lost it. And, and that's because I was physically in the most painful place I had ever been. To come anywhere close to setting an endurance record like the hour, you have to be physically gifted. And one of the greatest gifts a cyclist can have is a monstrous VO2 max. It's a measure of how good your body is at getting oxygen out of the air and into your tissues. VO2 max is a value that we test in the lab and we identify because really sets the upper limit of how much energy can be produced. That is Neil Henderson. He's the sports scientist who coached Stevens to her record and Rowan Dennis to his. Both athletes have massive VO2 max numbers. The thing is VO2 max output can only be sustained for maybe five or 10 minutes in a well-trained athlete. But a pro athlete can perform at a level just below their VO2 max for quite a bit longer than that. That level is called their anaerobic threshold. To find it, you measure something called lactate in the blood. Too much lactate and the effort can't be sustained. Those two tests in concert tell us what that absolute ceiling is and then how close to that ceiling you can redline and hold. To find my limits, Henderson put me through the same exercise that Stevens did, but this time he sampled my blood while I rode on the stationary bike. 6.8, we blew through, finally. So you got a 2.1 millimole change on that stage. That clearly indicates that you were basically, lactate was coming out of over the top. Then he tested my VO2 max. So this is a two-way valve. So he's gonna be breathing in and getting air from out here. And then as he exhales, it's gonna lock that off. And then what he exhales is gonna go in through here into the analyzer. This doesn't look intimidating at all. Same deal. I rode harder and harder and he measured my oxygen levels. I reached this point where I kept telling myself like 10 more seconds, 10 more seconds, 10 more seconds, right? Like I can do 10 more seconds, but around halfway through the 320 stage, my body was just Excellent. like, nope, can't do 10 more seconds, you you're wrong. Fantastic. What was my VO2 max? Your VO2 max, the absolute peak got into the 50s and in fact, 52.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, which is very good. I don't think you're gonna set an hour <laughs> record tomorrow um, with that, but that is well above a, an average value for so sure. So an Evie's value is what? 72, okay. 73. <laughs> yeah. The number of people on Earth with VO2 maxes in the 70s is just very small. Vanishing very small. small. Yeah, especially women in the 70s is like men in the 80s. There's a handful. Okay, so I'm definitely not a contender for the hour record, but that doesn't mean I can't try to get faster. I went to bike manufacturer Specialized to get a pro fit on a bike very similar to the one that Stevens used to set her record. But first, a new outfit. <laughs> then I got a custom, totally pro-level treatment from All fit right. specialist Aaron Post. Wow, yeah, this is super aggressive already. Yeah. He used an LED motion capture system to dial in every aspect of my position on the bike. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you just did your first 180 on a bike, my friend. I figured I wanted to get as low as possible to minimize wind resistance. But Post says that's not always the case. The arrow position is only arrow when you're in the arrow position. <laughs> Doesn't matter how cool your bike looks yeah. in transition area or sitting out there for the photo shoot before you go for an hour record, if you can't stay in those arrow bars, you're not gonna be faster. He's right. Staying in arrow position can be limiting. Too low and it makes it hard to breathe. It can even restrict blood flow. With my fit dialed in, I went into this beast. It's called the wind tunnel. W-I-N. Get it? Cool. Safety first, even in the tunnel. All right. You're going to go fast, right? Most wind tunnels are for testing cars and aircraft. Ugh. This one is made for people. 
Evelyn Stevens perfected her hour record position here. I tried riding in slightly different positions while the team at Specialized captured my aerodynamics data. I tried the lowest possible aero bar position for my fitting, and then I tried it two centimeters higher, which felt a lot better. Why so much focus on this? Because handlebars matter a lot to the hour record. In the 1990s, racers started exploiting unconventional and profoundly aerodynamic handlebar positions, like the praying mantis with the arms tucked up under the shoulders. Chris Boardman set what is now called the absolute hour record at 56.3 kilometers using this, the Superman position, arms stretched out into an air slicing dart. But in 1997, the rules changed. Everyone had to use classic drop bars, and under those constraints, no one could touch the absolute record. But then in 2014, the rules changed again, allowing for a sort of in-between position. Aero bars like these don't slice the wind like the Superman did, but they're way faster than drop bars. All right, so what, cool. what did the results show? All right, so your baseline position, again, was the most aggressive and lowest that we thought you could sustain in the fit lab. If we raise the pads two centimeters, because you said that, hey, that lower position might not be sustainable, especially over an hour. So we raised it to the two centimeters. And for you, it turned out that that position was actually absolutely no different in aerodynamic drag. So as an athlete, that's a win-win. You're able to hold the position, you're able to generate more power, and there's no aerodynamic drag penalty. Now the icing on the cake on top of all that is with that higher pad position, you were a lot more comfortable getting more aggressive with your head shrug. And by doing that, that saved a further about 5% or 15 watts That's huge. from your position, which is enormous when you're trying to go as fast as possible. To put it all together, Henderson took me to the US Olympic track in Colorado Springs, where Stevens set her record. Once you've gotten up to speed, hold right about 200 watts. First, I rode on a standard track bike. Given my measurements, 200 watts for an hour seemed possible. Right around 35K an hour. Say 35, yep. But I'd only go about 35 kilometers, just under 22 miles. Hardly a record setting distance. So Henderson swapped out some components. The first thing I'm gonna uh, change out here is gonna be the front wheel. This will actually make even more difference than the rear wheel, since this is the leading edge. The other thing we do is in terms of the tire width, this is an extremely narrow tire on this extremely narrow rims. Even if I wasn't born with a massive VO2 max, I could still be faster. <laughs> you are aerodynamically enhanced. Double disc, front rear, aero bars, aero helmet. It's go time, let's see what you got. All right. We're gonna go the same target power, 200 watts, which you're gonna see here, but Right. We should see clearly some significant increase in your speed. Next level. All right. With the same power output, I was suddenly able to pedal almost 40 kilometers an hour, or nearly 25 miles per hour. You just went 10% faster. Yeah. That's, that's big. Same output, 10% faster. Another way to look at that is it took us five minutes to put on about $5,000 worth of parts to buy us about five kilometers per hour. I looked faster, and I definitely felt faster, but I hadn't even approached the record speeds or tried to crank them out for 60 minutes. Remember, I couldn't even do a full minute on the trainer at the sort of power needed to challenge the men's record. This event isn't about all-out power. It's about metering your effort just right for an entire hour. And if you overcook it, there's a price to be paid. <laughs> if you start too fast, you're trying to do something that's effectively not possible. And these margins are so very small that if you go over that effort by just a small amount, 0.5%, doesn't sound like much. You know, for a male cyclist, a high level rider, that's literally a couple watts. But the cost of exceeding that can, on the end, in the last 10 or 15 minutes, cost 10, 15, 20, 50 watts that they can no longer produce what was just a half a percent too much for the first 45 minutes, and then they fade out and the speed drops. To get a sense of what the pros experience, Henderson paced me with an electric motorcycle. First, I tried riding 48 kilometers an hour, the women's speed record. Then I tried the men's speed. As you can see, I was wobbling all over the place. It's one thing to try and ride this hard on a trainer. Doing it on the track felt dangerous. 
So we got up to, to rowing speed, 52 and a half K an hour. And uh, about a lap. About a lap. As much as gear and training matter, so does the track. Concrete tracks like the one at Colorado Springs are a little slower than wooden ones. And the track's location and altitude make a big difference as well. Ultimately, a given rider can produce a certain amount of power output. The amount of power is going to affect the speed they go, but your selection of what track and where you go is going to have an impact on aerodynamics and air density specifically. So when we come up to altitude like we are here in Colorado, the air is less dense, though you also have a physiological constraint that you cannot produce quite as much power as you would at sea level. In most cases, there's a benefit though to performing at altitude, especially if you have conditioning and training being done at altitude so that you're prepared for the task. When Italian racer Vittoria Busi broke Steven's record, she went just 27 meters further. And she did it on a wooden track in Aguascalientes, Mexico. It's where many cycling records have been set. Aguascalientes is a faster track. It's at altitude, it's about 1800 meters high, so it's just a touch higher than Boulder here because of the air density, which is really the barometric pressure and humidity interactions, tends to be much warmer and then it's a wood 250 meter track versus a concrete 333. So it's got all the right characteristics to be very fast. How fast? Let's just say that I attempted the hour at 200 watts on this bike with this gear. Now I'm not gonna set a record by any means, but the right track could make a big difference. At an outdoor velodrome, like the one in Trexlertown, Pennsylvania, I would ride 37.35 kilometers. But in Colorado Springs, I'd get 38.75. And in Aguas Calientes, I would jump two full kilometers and go 40.9. And that's just the track. Factoring in their position and equipment can give an elite cyclist just enough edge to claim the record. So will we ever see the men's record hit 60 kilometers or the women's hit 50? Maybe. I do believe that 50 kilometers per hour is, is definitely in the realm for the women. They're you know, currently just, just under two kilometers shy of that. I do believe that the men, even with the current position, will be getting into the 55 and even 56 kilometer range, um, maybe 57. To break the 60 kilometer barrier under current rules, Henderson says you'd need a person capable of generating 450 watts while tucked into what would likely be a very painful aero position. And they'd probably have to do it in Aguas Calientes. But until that happens, remember that what athletes are doing already is almost impossible. <laughs>